Hey, Damon DeMarco here again for createx3.com. Last time I started talking about the human shadow because you asked me to, and I said I would do a multi-part series on what the shadow is and how I use exploration of the shadow in my own work so that maybe it can give you some ideas on how to do it in your own work. So that's what we're going to cover today. Part two is basically a personal story that I have about my own shadow, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but for right now, do the thing if you would please like subscribe join our community because that's really what it's about a lot of people are emailing me these days and saying cool things and they talk about typewriters and and they talk about stuff that they're working on and I try to get back to everybody as quickly as I can there's a newsletter also at createx3.com you can sign up for it there it's completely free let's get to it so today I wanted to tell you a story about how the shadow and I interacted with each other in a particular way and like I was saying last time the shadow is not necessarily evil the shadow is simply all that is unconscious. So when I was about six years old, as best I can remember, I was in an accident. I was playing with some other kids up the street. I can't name their names because they're alive still, I think. Let's call them the Finnegan family. Randy Finnegan and his brother Stevie. Randy Finnegan never liked me at all. Don't know why. Just didn't. He threw a rock at me one time and it hit me right here. I'm not sure if you can see this. There's like a scar right in there. Randy Finnegan did that to me at the ripe old age of five, I think I was. And when that happened, my head opened up and there was blood all over the place and my parents were, oh, don't worry about it, that's okay, children are children. The Finnegan parents were aghast. But it was the 1970s and kids got hurt a lot more than they did today and parents were a lot less aggressive about pursuing legal action against their neighbors than they are today. One day we were playing at the Finnegan house and I want to see if I can illustrate this. There was a hedge that ran perpendicular to the sidewalk. So here's the street, here's the sidewalk, and here's the hedge. Well, I was running toward the sidewalk this way, and here came Randy Finnegan this way on his Schwinn, with the hedge right here. I was essentially blind. I couldn't see Randy Finnegan coming. I didn't hear his bike. I was running, we were playing tag or flag football, or I forget what it was, but I slammed right into Randy Finnegan, or perhaps I should say he slammed into me. Randy Finnegan's old Schwinn had one of those long curved rusted fenders that in this case went straight into my right thigh, all the way down to the bone. The tire continued to turn. It flipped my entire leg, the flesh of my leg inside out. I knew all this in retrospect. I'm not going to show you the scar because I'm sure YouTube wouldn't particularly enjoy that. It, it's also a scar at this point. But at the time, I can assure you, it was much more than that. I don't remember much about what happened afterwards. I remember getting knocked back. I remember inhaling. I remember looking at Randy and going, don't do that! Some six-year-old response to that, like, don't, duty head, you know. I remember the look on Randy Finnegan's face. He just stared at me. Aghast. I remember all the other kids clustering around me. I remember them pointing and saying things like, oh my God, what happened? Like, look, look, look. And I was just, in retrospect, in a state of shock. They all pointed. I remember feeling funny, wooden a little bit like. And I remember looking down and seeing my leg, the mess of it. And that's all I remember. I probably blacked out after that. Like I said, I was six. I'd never seen my own body open to the world before. I'd never seen my own blood or the tissues inside the leg. It was a lot to take, I think. And so my consciousness, my mind did what it's supposed to do in those instances. It just shut down. It's, it's too much to process. What else do I remember? I remember sitting on the ground at one point and kids running everywhere trying to find where the adults were. My parents had gone for a walk around the block because my mother was pregnant with one of my brothers at the time. And I think my father had taken her on a walk around the block just, you know, to get her out of the house. And they were difficult to find. It might have taken 20 minutes. It might have taken closer to 30 or 40. 
It was a neighborhood in the 1970s in suburban central New Jersey. People were very neighborly back then. We all kind of looked out for each other. I don't remember being taken to the hospital. I do remember being in a wheelchair and my father, who had become extremely stoic, brought a white towel that he found from someplace and placed it over the wound so that I wouldn't have to look at it. I remember being wheeled up to the reception desk in the emergency room and the nurse who was on duty at the check-in didn't even look up from what she was doing. She looked bored. She was a large woman with very curly blonde hair and too much makeup. And she said, how can I help you? And my father said, look, and he pulled the cloth off my leg and the woman looked over and she went, oh, and just like that, we were admitted. There are a few other flashes that I remember, old images, feelings mostly. What I remember most is being in the family room of our house at the time and having these stitches in my leg. There were eight of them. And that amazed me. I'd never seen such a thing. I didn't understand why there were these prickly wires in my leg, in my body. I'd been told that they're to hold the wound closed. I was told, don't move, because you might reopen the wound. I was told, lie still. I was told, watch TV. And I believe I was given pain medication. I say this because in my memories, I, I disassociated. I remember lying there watching the TV sometimes, but a lot of times I felt very odd. Like I couldn't quite concentrate on anything and I would look around and I would notice the pattern on the carpet. I'd never noticed that before. And I would notice the paneling on the walls and I'd never noticed that before. And I would notice the strange ceiling and the funky 70s ochre and black carpet. I'd never noticed any of that before. And I think it's probably because I was on some kind of painkiller. I was six. I'd never taken a drug in my life. They were trying to keep me sedated. They were trying to keep me calm. They were trying to take the pain away. I never ran the same way again, looking back. It's funny because in high school, I ran cross country and I was on the winter track team and the spring track team. I was a distance runner and I did that even in college. And even today, I still run. But I would always have very, very stiff hips and problems with my lower back, pain, actual pain, that I could never quite get a beat on. There were times when I would throw my back out, you know that expression, right? I reach for something a certain way and suddenly everything seizes and like for weeks afterwards I've got a, I would have a cane and I would walk around like that. My father had that too, by the way, stress is what I think we eventually boiled it down to. At one point in my late 30s, I became so upset with this pain that I went to my doctor and I said, you, you've got to do an x-ray because I, something is wrong. Something is totally wrong. Something's off. I can't live with this pain anymore. It is irritating me. It is, I, I, can't, I can't do it anymore. I'd stop running at that point. I'd stop doing a lot of things because I just didn't feel like I was in my own body, like the engineering of my own body was faulty. Well, they did the x-ray and found absolutely nothing wrong with me, which was frustrating. And then one day, about two years ago, it was during the latter stages of the pandemic, the world was opening up again and I went to a party and I had a great time. I mean, <laughs> man, did I have a good time. I saw people I hadn't seen in so long, dear friends. And I met a lot of new people too. And we were just living it up because we'd finally been released after so long. Well, the most curious thing happened. I had been trying to run through the pandemic because I had to get out of this apartment. And I felt like I had to stay in the open air and I had to do something. I had to stay in shape. And I lived two blocks from Central Park, so I could run there and, and be away from people. If anybody came close to me, I'd simply I'd run away. 
I had a mask on, but that didn't matter, right? It was more like if anybody is social distancing, if somebody comes close to me, I'll just run away. So I'm running and running through Central Park, and, and I had always felt, again, that very curious tension. But this time, the morning after that party, I had a memory, the first one that I'd had in a very, very long time, of lying on that couch at six years of age with my leg mangled, looking down at that and wondering in my six-year-old way if I was ever going to walk again, let alone run and play and do all the things that I had always done, which I never did quite go back to in the same way. And it clicked for me as I was going around the Central Park Reservoir, this loop around this man-made kind of lake. I don't have to run like, like a little boy hiding his injury. I don't have to do that anymore. Instead, if I want to, I can run like a little injured boy. I can run like a boy with a hole in my leg, and the blood will stream down my leg and I will not care. I will run free. Again. And wouldn't you know it? The moment I started to imagine that, the moment I started to accept what had happened to me, I ran like the wind. I ran like I had never run in years. No pain. All the joints fluid. My feet barely touched the ground. It was a startling moment for me. It was a very confusing moment until I figured out what I think had happened. I confronted my shadow. That piece of myself that I had put into the bag that Robert Bly talked about, we talked about it in the last video. My parents, the doctors, the nurses, all the, all the adults trying to do right by me told me, don't, don't, don't move. Don't stay still. Don't, you're injured. Don't, 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 don't move. And a part of that, I think, got stuck in here because I didn't know any better. I was young. I didn't know any better. And so that went into the shadow bag, along with my love of playing tag and running and running free the way children do. But by confronting that head on, suddenly it was like I was reaching back into the bag and I was pulling out all those dark memories and I was pulling out all that stuff, the fear and the anger at the boy who had done that to me accidentally didn't matter and the sadness that i couldn't that they're telling me i can't run anymore and by allowing myself to experience all of that and saying it's okay it's okay to process all that it's okay to be injured the boundary which was self-imposed in my mind it just went away. Years later, I, I read about dolphins in an aquarium. They were in a big tank, right? Dolphins swimming around. And one day, they wanted to clean the tank. And so the way they would do this, right, is they, they would put a partition here, and the dolphin would be here, and it would butt its nose against the glass. And it, it eventually learned, dolphins are very smart, it eventually learned that it would butt its nose against the glass, and it learned that there was a partition here, do you see? And they're, they're off, and it took them months, I guess, to clean the other part of the glass, right? And so the dolphin's swimming around in this half. What happens is they, they took the glass away, and wouldn't you know it? The dolphin never swam the whole tank again. It had conditioned itself to stay in the side of the tank that it had been confined to for a long time. That's kind of like what we're like, I think. Most human beings I know have some part of themselves that has been put away, shelved, repressed, stuffed into a dark place, told... You, it's, you should be ashamed of that, or they're afraid of something that they've done, some wild fit of anger, or some outburst of emotion which is frowned upon by parents or society or family or what have you. Utterly human things, by the way. But the more of these things we put away, the more we lose of ourselves. I'm not using this as an excuse. I'm not trying to say that we should all run around and blast our anger at, all over the place. No, that's not what I'm saying. I am saying that if we don't take a look at the stuff that's been pushed down into that bag, it will come back and it will haunt us. It will inhibit our work as creatives. I know that for a fact. 
And you don't want that, believe me. You don't want your past and the things that you haven't dealt with getting in the way of your painting, your singing, your writing, your acting, your whatever. You don't want that? No. As a matter of fact, sometimes I think the real work of artists, apart from the techniques that we learn, the scales that we learn as a musician, or the sentence structure and story structure that we learn as writers, the vast technique that we learn as actors, and so on and so forth, dancers, pot throwers, sculptors, composers, Yes, we learn the techniques of these things, but I think really the real work, at least for me, and maybe for you, is to remember that it's okay to be an artist. It's okay to follow your impulses. It's okay to let them lead you to something that might be a little frightening to you, but that's part of the fun, isn't it? Seeing where you are going to take you, that's a whole lot of fun because it's us getting to know ourselves all over again. It's like Bly said last time, Robert Bly, the poet, the writer, to paraphrase, most people get into their 40s and they feel the weight of this bag that they've been dragging around with them, this shadow bag, all the stuff that they've shoved down into that bag. And at a certain point in your life, usually around midlife, it just becomes crushing and you have a decision to make. You can either investigate what's in that bag and why you put those things there in the first place. Or you can let it just drag you down to the dirt. So, I hope that that example in some way illustrated what recovery from the shadow can be like. In the next parts of this series, it might be one or two, I don't know, we'll see how it goes. I'll talk a little bit more about the shadow and, and I'll give you some exercises that I use to try and delve into the shadow and explore it and bring a torch or a candle or sometimes even a laser beam into a very dark place so that you can get to know yourself better and that all of that good stuff that maybe you put down into that bag will show up in your work, whatever that might be. Okay? All right. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, blah, blah, blah. For CreateX3, I'm Damon DeMarco. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay creative.